Hello and welcome to The New Conversation. I'm Dwight McBride, president of The New School. Thank you so much for joining us for this series where I converse with thinkers, creators, and doers about the critical issues of our time. This is the last episode of this season, but I can't wait to meet you back here in the fall with a new group of incredible guests. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can get updates on the next season, as well as more videos from amazing speakers, faculty, and students from across the new school. Today's guest is Dr. Carol Anderson. She's a historian, a New York Times bestselling author, a Guggenheim Fellowship winner, a recent inductee to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an intellectual powerhouse, and an authentically beautiful human to her core, who I'm proud and honored to call my friend. I know her from my time at Emory University, where she is the Charles Howard Candler Professor and also chair of the Department of African American Studies. She's an expert in the ways that public policy and politics affect race and equity. She's written four books, including White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for criticism in 2016. Her most recent book is called One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. She's also been featured in several documentary projects, including the 2019 documentary After Selma, the 2020 Netflix Explained series episode, Whose Vote Counts, BET and CBS News Boiling Points episode three on Bloody Sunday, and most recently the 2020 Amazon Prime documentary, All In, The Fight for Democracy, along with Stacey Abrams. I know we're going to have an incredible conversation today. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Carol. It's so good to see you. Oh, it's so good seeing you. Great seeing you. (laughs) So we we go back a ways. And um, of course, I knew of you and your scholarship um, long before we met because you co-chaired the search committee um, that recruited me to Emory. And I really want our viewers to know that in addition to being really a bona fide academic star, it is also important uh, to you that you're able to be a fully engaged citizen in an academic community. I want to begin by asking, when did you first know that you were going to be a historian? You know, our pathways are never smooth, easy. Um, I knew that I was fascinated by the world around me um, because my brother was sent to Vietnam Mm -hmm. and it was me trying to figure out What was he doing over there? Who were these communists? What is a communist? Um, Trying to just figure it out as a child. Um, And then as I went through, um, I I double majored in history and political science as an undergrad. My master's is in poli sci. And then I was out uh, in the world of work for years uh, and, 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 and figuring out when I'm going back to get my PhD. I didn't know whether it was going to be in poli sci or history. And I, the, I was at Ohio State, and Ohio State had its Mershon series, where it had its political science professors giving their talks over lunch for a broader audience. And it was sitting there in those talks when I realized, you know what? This isn't how I want to understand the world and talk about it. I am a storyteller. I, I believe in the power of these stories in gripping you and sending you into a place. And that was that moment where I knew I was getting the PhD in history. Yeah. Carol, it, 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 you are indeed a storyteller. It's one of the things that makes your writing so powerful. It's one of the things that makes you, as a presenter, I've seen you, have been privileged to see you present many times um, to broad publics as well. And, and so, you know, there's this moniker that people like to attach um, of being a public intellectual. And certainly, uh, if it uh, if it's real and if we ascribe to it, you're certainly one of the people I'd put in that category. Um, if that's a term that resonates with you at all, you know, was that kind of work and storytelling that you do so seamlessly, was that intentional as a choice for you? Um, it was, it, again, my story is backwards in that I ended up in higher education administration first. I was an associate vice chancellor at the Ohio Board of Regents 
And then I became a faculty member um, at, at the University of Missouri. So I always had this engagement with public policy and seeing the power of public policy in shaping and, 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 and sometimes undermining the quality of lives of people and sometimes enhancing the quality of lives of people. And I knew being able to get that backstory was really important to policymakers. I mean, part of my work at the Board of Regents was writing up these histories of how we got here um, for these policymakers. So I always saw myself in that way. Um, and so my first book, when my first book, Eyes Off the Prize hit, and I was like, yes! Um, <laughs> oh, you could have heard the James Brown. Ow! I feel good. <laughs> there's nothing like that first book coming out. It's just, it, there's, there's nothing like it. There's just nothing, nothing. Oh, it, it, oh, it was just, mm. um, and that was a hard struggle. That yeah. was a hard struggle. And when the uh, Amnesty International USA contacted me and said it wanted to use my book as the framework for understanding human rights in the United States, I was like, yes. Mm. I mean, so it is one of those, so it's always been so important to me that my work wasn't simply, simply in the academy, but that it had a broader impact in the public because that's what speaks to me. Um, so being natural, I don't know, uh, but but being able to to make legible the 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 tectonic plates that move our societies and that create these schisms and chasms. Um, that was what was so important to me. I'd be remiss uh, while I have you here to not talk a bit about voting rights, which of course is one of the things you've been helping to educate the nation about our history, our troubled history in this, in this regard. Um, so I do wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, your recent book on voting rights and um, it's so important for our time. And you, of course, um, like all of us, I'm sure have been laser focused right now on Georgia um, and what we're seeing there. I know you're seeing up close and personal as a resident of Georgia right now too. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you, as you think about the politicians and their push to disenfranchise people of color in the state, are these challenges that you saw on the horizon as you were writing the book? Um, or is this is it just kind of coincidental that, uh, that this came to fruition in this moment? What prompted one person no vote, how voter suppression is destroying our democracy, was yeah. the 2016 election. And it was listening to the pundits just get it wrong. Um, because what they kept saying was, well, you know, black folks just didn't show up. You know, they just, you know, they weren't filling Hillary. Ooh, and, you know, and so that's why we have Trump, because black folks just didn't show up. We always need the narrative of black pathology to justify <laughs> some wrongness in America, right? And, and I was like, this is the first presidential election in 50 years without the protection of the Voting Rights Act. How you miss that huge variable, I don't know. And so I set out to make it really plain what it was that we saw in 2016. And what we saw in 2016 was that after the US Supreme Court had gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013 with Shelby County v. Holder, that we saw a wave of voter suppression laws just metastasize. And yes, I just mixed a metaphor there, uh, metastasized <laughs> throughout the United States. Um, but we saw it and, and how it was cloaked. It looked like old Jim Crow to me yeah. because it was the way, and that was the historian's lens being brought to bear on this, yeah. was because the way that Jim Crow came up in Mississippi with the Mississippi plan, they didn't write a law saying, we don't want black folks to vote. But Lord, they didn't want black folks to vote, oh. <laughs> right? So what they did was they wrote a law, they, the Mississippi plan looked at the legacies of slavery and then attached access to the ballot box via those legacies. And that was their way to move around the 15th amendment that said, thou shalt not abridge the right to vote on account of race, color or previous condition of servitude. So they used the poverty that slavery brought about 
for the poll tax. Mm -hmm. And what the poll tax meant was that it amounted to somewhere between two to 6% of a black Mississippi farm family's annual income to vote. Imagine paying two to 6% of your annual income to vote. And then the same thing with the literacy test, you know, by using the ban on education, throughout slavery and then the, the, um, the under, underfunding of black schools, then requiring folks to be able to read sections of the constitution, yep. come on, right? Yep. And, and so it was seeing this pattern, it's the same pattern. Voter ID is that same pattern. Um, moving polling places, requiring people to have transportation to go so much further to be able to vote. Um, all of these these components, and that's what I set out to to lay out, so that we would be forewarned and forearmed. Um, and and so you saw massive mobilization in the 2018 uh, midterm election. Um, I mean, that flipped the house because folks were now forewarned and forearmed. We saw it again in 2020. This is what I call that white rage backlash <laughs> that we're looking at now. Uh, because you know, one of the things I had laid out in White Rage is that whenever you have this advancement toward Black folks' civil rights, you get this massive wave of policies set out to undermine and undercut those rights. That's what we're seeing right now in this wave of voter suppression laws. It's been just so so important this work, and I don't think it overstates the case. And I want to say it here that. Stacey Abrams is the sort of public and political face of organizing in this work, and she has done such important work in this arena. Yes. But you have also been the academic and intellectual heft of this work. And I think it's the power of both of those things and how they've been able to come together in this moment that really gives me hope um, that there may be some better times ahead. So I, I'm just, I'm grateful for the work. I'm grateful for your insistence on being out there in the arena, doing this work, educating publics, uh, it's just so important. What, what are you thinking as you look at the midterm elections? Lord, we have got to organize, mobilize, energize, and get folks to the polls. Yeah. So much of what we're seeing is a, a fissure between an evidence-based electorate and one that has been put in this biosphere of lies, um, where, where, I mean, so it's like looking at Arizona, where they're doing, the Republicans are doing a recount in Maricopa County only, right? Um, under, under really tawdry circumstances um, as a way to continue to, to perpetuate this lie of a stolen election. It was that lie that led to the insurrection at the Capitol. I worry that um, one of the things, for instance, that Georgia did in its law, in its SB 202, was to allow challenges at the polls. So when you got, and so what we know is that when you have polling stations that are predominantly black, predominantly brown, you can expect these GOP people to come in the same way they did previously yeah. and, and challenge the legitimacy of the voters in line, to harass them, to demand to see their papers. The law now makes that very, very legal and very, very possible. And it puts penalties on counties for not following up quickly on these challenges. And so what I see is creating a, 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 creating a circus, a chaos, a chaotic circus during the elections um, under the guise of election integrity um, because they know that their policies are so far to the right that as America diversifies, there's just, it cannot resonate fully with that diversity. This is why we must push for um, HR1, S1, uh, which is the For the People Act. And this is why we also must push for HR4, which is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, so that we get some level of stability in the 2022 midterms um, that can prevent what these states are trying to do 
in terms of undermining the access of American citizens to the ballot box. There's such a movement right now in public discourse that I describe as anti-intellectual, as suspicious of and even discrediting expertise. Um, How can we as academics, and especially those of us who work on such critical issues um, like race and white supremacy and um, um, issues for our democracy, how can we educate and, um, the public and participate more fully in public life? I firmly believe, and I pulled on this when I was going out giving talks on white rage, mm-hmm. um, that we, we often think of like what I call the Fox News crowd that's in that, that, that bubble and, and, and they're happy there. Yeah. That, that, you're not going to reach them. <laughs> um, but the bulk of folks just don't know. And so the way that we do it is evidence-based. Like it was so important for me and when I was writing White Rage that I cited everything um, because it was so important that this wasn't just, oh, this is this black woman just saying this. This was documented, 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 documented. And I firmly believe that when we can have a a, a conversation that is evidence-based, then we begin to have more truthful conversations, more productive conversations, much more helpful conversations that can move into a different realm. And so one of the things I talked about was affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because, you know, that's almost like the third rail because folks are like, they had to let in all of those unqualified, right? (laughs) How many times have we heard this? Too many. Too many. Well, what the admissions counselors actually know is that the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action in college admissions are males. <laughs> and, and so when I start having this conversation and I break it down, it's like, because in high school, young women take their grades much more seriously than young men, and they take their extracurriculars much more seriously. And so if you're looking at GPA and extracurriculars and honor societies, the young women are here. The young men are here. Um, and so if admission counselors just were, were uh, admitting folks based on that, you'd have these really gendered, imbalanced incoming classes. That's and then right. I, right, and I lay out the complications from gendered, imbalanced classes and what that means for the president of a university, for the board of trustees, for rankings, um, for having... Uh, plummeting at, um, admission uh, applications for admissions yep. when you've got all of this overhead for buildings and tenured faculty. And so the, re- the reaction then is, okay, so we're going to cut off women much higher and then dig deep in the pile yep. to get enough men. And the parents who are sitting in that audience are going, sitting there going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, almost like Roberta Flack killing me softly. They know they're baby boys, right? Absolutely, <laughs> right? absolutely. And so then you have to ask yourself, why are we getting this narrative of unqualified minorities taking admissions spots when in fact what we're having are predominantly males taking admission slots? Why is that? And so when we begin to ask the question of what work, what kind of work is this narrative doing, then we're having a much different conversation about race in America. And so to me, what, what the work of the public intellectual is and what the work of really good, strong scholarship is, is to get to the folks who want to know but don't know. Mm. Um, that's how we change this tide. I love that. I love that. And if we focus on those folks and um, recognize the noise for what it is from from, uh, the other folks, um, it gives us real work to do. And 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 we don't live in the place of so much frustration all the time as well. I want to talk about something that I know is uh, deeply personal. You have two children, adult children who are on the autism spectrum. and more attention and, and media representations being given uh, publicly uh, to autism these days than ever before. Uh, we still have a long way to go in helping our society, I think, to understand um, the unique challenges and talents of people living with autism. But I, I wanted to ask you how, it's, how it has been to parent special needs children in, this, in the context of this culture. 
I think Langston you said it ain't no crystal stairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has been it has been a journey. Yeah. Um, um, finding resources uh, that the boys need um, in order to thrive, um, being able to access those resources, sometimes having to go toe to toe with a series of bureaucracies um, while, while still trying to do my work as a, a professor, as a teacher and as a scholar. Um, it has, I mean, there were times, so like when we moved to Missouri um, and my son Aaron um, was in a special ed class mm -hmm. and they had a teacher there who had not worked with kids on the autism spectrum. And one of the things with his autism is that he will move your hand to what he wants, right? Every time he moved her hand, she was writing him up for assault. Wow. Wow. Yes. And so it is, it is fighting these structures. Um, it is, um, it is doing the dance of joy when one of the structures works. You're like, yes, yes. Woo! <laughs> um, it is um, knowing that your day will be like this and then something will happen that will just send it uh, off into another realm. Cal, you've accomplished, I mean, incredible things. I mean, it's incredible things. Um, and even with um, the challenges you've just been speaking about, what, what keeps you going? I think about my people. I think about my great grandfather who was enslaved and who he fell in love with the woman next door on the other next door plantation. And he refused to work until he could be with her. And I think about the courage that it takes to tell your owner, no, I'm not doing that unless I can marry her. Right. Wow. I just, I mean, I'm like looking at that kind of courage. And then, so he was able to marry her and then he worked to buy her freedom and then buy his, and then they took off out West to buy some land. And I just, I'm thinking, I come from that. <laughs> I would say I am no ways tired. <laughs> um, when, when you, when you know the strength and the courage that it took to take on a system that denied you your own humanity. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and it, right, you know, it just, we fight, we fight, we fight so that the next generation doesn't have to have this fight for their own humanity. That's what keeps me going. You know, I, I, I think about how my father um, was a career military man fighting in a Jim Crow army, mm -hmm. uh, fighting for a democracy that did not recognize his right to vote. Um, yeah, yeah. The mitigated nature of black citizenship historically is just, I mean, it's just so, it's, un, it, it's unrelenting historically in this country. It was built in at the foundation uh, of, of our, at our, at our founding. And it is just, Though you know the stories, you hear the story, you understand the history, we're students of history, it's still sometimes just the hearing of it is stunning. Yeah. It's stunning that Black folk have done all of the things that they have done despite all of that, um, that incredible, that incredible history. So I've got a new book coming out. Um <laughs> And it really deals with what I call that fractured citizenship. And so this book is on the Second Amendment. Um, right. And and because, you know, because we're trying to figure out, you know, you hear uh, if black folks had stormed the Capitol like that. It's it was the it was my second thought that I had when this first started to happen after I was like, what the heck? what is going on? Right. right. 
And then um, my second thought was, this would have been a massacre. Boom. This right. would have been a massacre if black folk, many of them armed, would have stormed the U.S. Capitol? And, and so it is to understand that juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I like in the book uh, with Kyle Rittenhouse, um, the 17-year-old in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, who, yeah. who gunned down three men, killing two of them, and got to go home, and then became this darling of the right wing um, and, and, and they're talking about his second amendment rights and the, the police in Kenosha, Wisconsin had welcomed him there saying, oh, we really appreciate you guys here. And I juxtaposed that to Tamir Rice, who yeah. was gunned down playing in a park by himself with a toy gun, gunned down within two seconds. Yeah, that's real. That's yeah, real. So, so I'm looking at this history on how did we get here? How did we get here? And I'm, I start in the 17th century <laughs> and, and take us through to understand this fractured citizenship. I love um, historian's lens. I love it. <laughs> um, it's so important. Um, I, I, I want to um, ask you one more question. Um, and, and you referenced them earlier, talking about... Um, Young people, we both do a lot of work uh, with young people. Uh, we're in that business. Um, and I'm so um, both impressed and also awed by this generation of young people. Yes. Um, and their protest, their specific brand of it that feels different than our generation of protest. Mm -hmm. um, what advice? do you have for them now in the context of the world that they've inherited? Um, what, what advice do you give to young people? Um, it's several things. One, when we're talking about the right to vote, you know, I'm talk. I say you are the largest generation in America. You, your demographics are larger than the baby boomers. If you voted at the rate that the baby boomers did, you could transform this nation and transform the world with that political power. Do not cede, C-E-D-E, -E, your power. Yeah. The reason they're coming after it is because they know how important it is. The other thing that I talk about um, is you know, like when they're choosing what they want to do with their lives, with their majors, and 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 they're being told, well, you know where to go, where the money is. Yeah. And I'm like, mm -mm. feed your intellectual soul. When you're feeding your intellectual soul, you are flying in your excellence. Yeah. And excellence finds excellence. Yeah. Excellence rewards excellence. When you're doing what you love, so like when they're finding, working on their research papers, I tell them it's like a date. I said, do you ever have those dates where you're at the cup of coffee at the first thing and you're like, Lord, I can't wait to get rid of this coffee so <laughs> I can just say bye. <laughs> um, and then you've had those days Asking where- Asking for an ice cube to put in the coffee. Can I have an ice cube over here? <laughs> <laughs> you just put it over. <laughs> um, and, and then I said, and then when you've had those that just is three o'clock in the morning and you're still engaged. You want the conversation to continue. That's what feeding your intellectual soul is like. Yeah. And so when you do that, you are really walking in your excellence. You are walking in who you are. Enjoy it, embrace it, roll around in it, fly yeah. in it. Yes. I think we're going to leave it there, my dear friend. I cannot thank you enough for making the time to be here and to doing this um, and, and just wishing you all the very best uh, with the new book. I can't wait to have you on campus at the new school to have a discussion about the new book. And I can't wait to just spend some time with you after this horrible pandemic um, that we're living through is over as well. Oh. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much, Dwight. Thank you. This was wonderful. I miss you. <laughs> I miss you too. I miss you too.